This is something I'm really passionate about and I have been for, for a long time. But I think it's just important to, to mention just a few things about what, what it's not about to start with um, and what it isn't. So first of all, it's not a, a water park or some kind of theme park. It's completely the opposite of that. Uh, secondly, it's, it's not a commercially driven ambition. And in fact, it never has been. You know, I've already walked away from a number of potential investors over the last two or three years who I felt have focused overly on the financials and the returns of this potential investment and business um, at the potential risk or cost, in my opinion, of the massive social and community benefits which this scheme can bring. So it's not a commercially driven ambition, it's deeply purpose-led. It's always been about delivering a deeper purpose. And if we can deliver that purpose, which I obviously believe that we can, then that will generate as an output good economics and make this an investable proposition so we can bring it to market, not the other way around. So that's really important. And then the third thing that this isn't is, it's not just a wave pool, it's always been a bigger and a deeper vision than that. Really trying to create what is an immersive, what we're calling a surf wellness resort with, with world-class waves at the center and which is purpose-led like I've mentioned. But what, am I, what I mean by that is it is, it's authentic, it's inclusive, it is anchored around health and well-being, it's educational, and it's rooted in sustainability. So what we're proposing to bring to market is a lifestyle destination which enables people of all ages, of all abilities, and of all disabilities to be able to enjoy an environment which fosters the, the opportunities to push boundaries, to make new friendships, to experience personal growth, to improve their health and well-being. It will be an educational platform. It will enable and encourage communities to reconnect. And in the process, we will drive, I hope, meaningful tourism to the area who will stay for longer periods of time, spend more money, support local businesses and generate hundreds of jobs. Authentic and inclusive, so they're two things that are fundamental to the fabric of this surf wellness resort. First of all, in terms of authentic, what I mean in, in this particular context is it needs to be rooted in surfing and surf culture and surfing's value system. In my experience, that value system is incredibly powerful and it's very applicable into everyday life and can almost transcend into everyday life you know, it can teach you really important values like resilience, respect, you know, learning to be comfortable in sometimes uncomfortable situations. It can teach you, and it does teach you, the importance of being, of being present and being in the moment. It teaches you to be courageous. It teaches commitment. It teaches vulnerability. And wow, that's a value that a lot of people aren't willing to showcase, you know, being vulnerable and putting themselves in difficult situations. So it's a very powerful value system. It exists across other action sports too, which I've also seen, I'm a, I love snowboarding for example, um, but it's something I really want to embed into the, into the business. And then in terms of inclusivity, you know, this is, I would say this is absolutely imperative. This is a place which needs to be able to be enjoyed by people of all ages, of all abilities and all disabilities. So that everybody can throw themselves into the environment and the facilities, enjoy them and feel their power. The ocean is often quite an intimidating place. Um, it can sometimes feel quite inaccessible. It'll, it can sometimes feel quite almost non-inclusive. If you're a beginner, for example, if you're not a great swimmer, if you, you know, are perhaps super anxious about marine wildlife like sharks or you don't know a spot there might be hazards there rocks you don't necessarily know about if you struggle with mental or physical challenges which make navigating the ocean and its currents and its general environment a bit more difficult it can be intimidating surfing is really fun we're all equal 
and we should all be able to enjoy the stoke and just the general joy of being in the water with no egos and no barriers. Physical and mental well-being are, um, are key aspects of this scheme. Um, I'm a huge believer in the power of, of blue health. It's quite a well-versed term these days, to be honest, but the power of and the therapeutic benefits of being in water and actually around water, particularly moving water, is profound. You know, it has been proven to have massive impact on people's lives in terms of anxiety, confidence levels and overall physical and mental well-being. And linked to that, you know, there's no question that we are at an inflection point in time, almost a tipping point, I suppose, where mental health is becoming a major concern, particularly for young people. The New York Times recently referred to it as being a national emergency in the US. I personally believe the same is true over here. More and more kids, but more and more people in general, but particularly children, are struggling with it. And there is less and less capacity to deal with them. I think more than 75% of kids who struggle with one kind of mental health challenge are unable to get the support that they need. So we actually have to find alternative solutions to support them. We have to. And surf therapy is without question one of them. As such as its power that the NHS has started to prescribe surf therapy to young kids with mental health challenges. And around the world there are a number of incredible charities doing some wonderful things around surf therapy. For example, programs to support the police and the blue light services, veterans with PTSD, stroke victims, people recovering from cancer, and also kids from some of the most deprived and dangerous communities on the planet where I've spent some time the last couple of years living in Cape Town, you know, I've been privileged enough to spend some time with a charity on the southern coast of Cape Town called Waves for Change, who do some incredible things for the communities and the townships in that particular area. They've run over 90,000 surf therapy programs for kids, benefiting, I think, nearly 2,500 children with extraordinary outputs um, and outcomes. So. It's powerful, you know, for me personally, it's been a massive factor in my life too, particularly in, the, in terms of bereavement. So I lost my dad nearly 10 years ago to the day as it happens, um, who died of motor neurone disease. It's been a massive help for me personally, almost unwittingly, the ocean and the mountains too, but particularly the ocean have helped me navigate my way through that and continue to help me navigate my way through that. So it's powerful. It works, and I'm passionate about it. Education has always been really important to this entire project from the get-go. It was very important to me and my team to have a dedicated educational hub, which is what we, we're calling a, a learning hive, um, as a key component of the master plan. Essentially a place where we can run a full-time program of courses for, uh, dedicated for young people, including things like educational intervention programs designed to re-engage local kids with their, their learning journey and help them to rediscover the passion and the love for learning. Marine conservation courses, which is something that is not really included in the UK curriculum, so kids don't necessarily learn about marine wildlife and their ecosystems and therefore they'll never really develop a passion or an intrinsic desire I suppose when they get older to find a way to support them. Water and ocean, and ocean safety courses are also very important to us as are a bunch of other courses. But I'm also very very passionate about getting more children outside and away from their devices. I feel strongly that if we can get kids in the outdoors and get them to experience the joy and the wonder of, of being out here in nature, you know, enable them to reconnect with the outdoors and reconnect with nature, that will, that will result in them having this intrinsic desire to protect what they've learned to love as they get older. And I've seen that philosophy work personally really well at a place called Green School, 
in Cape Town, South Africa, where I've been educating my own kids for the last 18 months to two years. They adopt a very similar approach in terms of their educational construct. And there are some charities over here in the UK too, which do a similar thing and follow a similar philosophy. One of which is started by a lady called Jane Goodall, who's a, who's a very well-known environmentalist. She started something called Roots and Shoots. And the objective there is pretty much the same, is to get more children outdoors and to reconnect with nature. Ultimately, they are the future collaborators, the future change makers and innovators that we need as a planet to pass the band to when we're long gone. And that starts with getting them to reconnect with nature and to love being outside. And I think we can really help in that regard. Sustainability is, is, is very much rooted in, in everything that we do and that we plan to do. It sounds, it, it may sound a bit of a throwaway comment or a buzzword or a kind of glib remark, but at the end of the day, me and my team, we love surfing, we love the ocean, we love mountains, we love being in the great outdoors. You know, the environment and sustainability are in our DNA. You know, we've all seen some of the devastating climate related impacts on the natural world, on our various travels, pursuing our passions. And it's, it's horrific. I mean, in the ocean currently, plastic pollution, as everybody knows, is a major problem. I think over a million marine birds die every year from ingesting it. And I think over 100,000 other marine creatures also die every year from ingesting it. And it's only getting worse. In terms of pollution, that is off the charts at the moment. Corporates and water companies seem to be treating the oceans like some kind of garbage tip. It is absolutely unacceptable. In the summer alone, I think there were over two and a half thousand releases of, or discharges of raw sewage and relatively untreated sewage into our seas. And when I relocated from Cape Town back in June, there were all sorts of warnings around the UK not to go swimming in the water for fear of getting E. coli, which obviously happened. A lot of people got very, very sick from E. coli. It's an absolute joke, it's an absolute disgrace, and something needs to be done about it. So look, I feel very passionate about sustainability in the environment. I wanna use the Sea Hive to shout about these issues, to create more noise and more urgency about them, to bring people together so we can try and collaborate more and make change. And also sustainability will be embedded into the fabric of all of our decisions. So from using energy efficient and recycled products for construction, operating processes, if we are able to get that far through the planning process, of course, things like waste management, again, seeking inspiration from the Green School, where, I, where I've been, you know, they were able to get to a, a point where there's they're zero waste to landfill site, which sounds which is actually harder than it sounds. And they did this partly by implementing a, what's called a closed leave consumption cycle, where they effectively take organic waste from the kitchens to nourish the gardens, which then are used, which then obviously grow and harvest new plants and vegetables and fruits, which are then recycled back into the kitchens again for the kids to eat. Our wave technology, wave garden, so they were selected for many reasons, but one of the main ones was because of their, their credentials from a sustainability and energy efficiency perspective. Their water filtration process is very environmentally friendly. It's mainly comprised of fine filtration and ozone and UV disinfection, a small amount of chlorine, but they're looking at ways to eradicate that altogether. Energy consumption in general, very, very important to me and my team. You know, we want to be as off grid as possible. And certainly in terms of the wave generation, the energy required for that, it feels right and it feels responsible thing to do to generate our own energy to create the waves. I don't feel comfortable not doing that. So that's very, very important to us. Other wave pools around the world have managed to do it, so I know it's possible. Uh, and then also planting schemes. We want to try and plant fruit forests, medicinal corridors, herbal gardens, all linked back to the education point to get more kids outside and connected with the great, with the great outdoors. Sustainability is, is, is absolutely front and center.
In terms of facilities, at the centre of the master plan will be a Wave Garden Cove surf lagoon. So this surf lagoon is an, is an awesome piece of engineering which can generate over 20 different types of waves from 50 centimetres high up to over 2 metres, providing rides of 15 or 16 seconds long for people of all ages and abilities. And then overlooking the lagoon will be our clubhouse, uh, an epic building. Downstairs will be the Surf Academy and then upstairs we'll have um, a retail space, well, a retail shop, F&B facilities, so our restaurant, our cafe and our bar. We'll have some chill out spaces, we'll have a conference facility and we'll have a dedicated work zone as well as a really awesome immersive balcony overlooking the waves with a radical vibe and environment and probably some of the best surf views in Europe. And then surrounding the lagoon, we're going to have a bunch of interconnected facilities really targeted towards families um, and anchored around health, well-being and adventure. These include beach zones with, depending on the weather, volleyball courts, uh, a wellness hub or kind of wellness facility which will have a yoga zone and also a fitness zone. The fitness zone will be more focused around body weight training, uh, crossfit training, calisthenics type training and activities as opposed to your typical gym. And then also we'll have a, um, a splash pool, a world-class pump track, as well as a dedicated learning hive, which I've already mentioned, and also a small number of eco-designed lodges down one flank of the lagoon overlooking the waves. I want the sea hive to be, you know, like going to a mate's house. I want it to feel like a second home, a really awesome, welcoming vibe with really cool, authentic people and no egos. Whether you're coming for a quick surf on your lunch break, whether you want to come for a bite to eat, for breakfast, lunch and or dinner, if you're coming on your own, if you're coming with your mates, if you're coming with your kids, your other half or your entire family, there'll be something for everyone to do and for everyone to feel connected, to have fun and to leave feeling reinvigorated. In terms of the community, I think there's a number of different strands to this question. Obviously, in addition to the jobs that we'll create both directly and indirectly, on the back of tourism coming down here, people staying for longer, spending more and therefore supporting the local businesses, which is a massive benefit on its own. Firstly, mental health. I've already talked about that a little bit in a previous question. I don't just believe or hope that we can help adults and kids alike who struggle with anxiety, confidence, depression, social exclusion, bereavement, even suicidal thoughts. I know we can. I categorically know we can. I've seen it. Secondly, education. Again, I've touched on that previously. You know, by running educational intervention programs for, lo for local kids, I believe we can help them to re-engage with their learning, whilst at the same time helping them to to really build positive relationships and support networks here. Ultimately, it's a safe emotional space. It's a safe environment with no judgment. And, you know, we really hope that we can help some of these local children to fall back in love with their learning and embed it into their DNA for their life. You know, ultimately, we should all be learning for our whole lives, not just at school. So that's key. And I would love to see that shine through with regards to their attendance level or the attendance records at school, obviously greater confidence in their own personas, but then also more ambition, you know, in, in, in their careers. Thirdly, I would say, and again, I've touched on this too, but really looking to help local children get outside more and just get away from their devices, really. You know, we'll be looking to run programs and holiday camps in conjunction with the government's holiday activities and food program, which is important and it's particularly focused at, at more disadvantaged children who perhaps, I would say, have less healthy holidays because they don't have the opportunity or the support network and mechanism to really get outside. So supporting them and then also weaving in some of the green school philosophy, which I've mentioned previously, to help children fall back in love with nature and, and to reconnect with it. But I think what's also important is a sea hive is conceptualized and planned to connect people. 
That's what it's all about, really. It's connecting people, communities, and bringing them together. It's creating and fostering a, a safe environment for people to push boundaries, make new friendships, experience personal growth, all those wonderful things. And that is where the magic happens. That is where the magic happens. In my life, I reckon the people I feel closest to, over and above my own family, of course, are people I've probably only spent maybe two or three weeks with maximum. But during those weeks, we did things and we pushed our own personal limits and we shared moments and experiences which brought us together in such a close and authentic way. It's so powerful. And if we can bottle that up and bring it here to the Sea Hive, it will make a huge difference to the local community. Surf therapy is, is something, like I've mentioned before, is becoming recognised as a, as a genuine form of, of therapy for not just children, but frankly, all people who struggle with mental health. I'm not an expert in it, you know, but essentially it uses surfing as a tool to equip and enable people to overcome and deal with mental health challenges that they might, they might be having to, having to deal with on their own. And in terms of how it works, you know, from what I've learned, having spent time with this charity called Ways for Change in Cape Town, South Africa, also having seen it for myself and its, its impact on, on young people and adults, to be fair, who I know, and personally speaking, how it's helped me deal with bereavement, I know it works. And the reason why I think it works, I guess it's kind of multi-layered. First of all, the ocean is or just being outdoors, I suppose, but particularly being in the ocean and in moving water, it helps to reduce levels of anxiety. You know, the ocean and the sea, we all know, is inherently calming. Whether it's the regularity of the waves or the rhythm of the waves or whatever it is, it's a very, very calming environment to be in. It's also an environment that is not judgmental. You know, being out in the ocean, there is no judgment. Um, and that's that means, and that's an important one because it means it's a, it's a safe emotional space, which is important for children in particular. Surfing is also fun, and you're almost doing therapy without necessarily realizing you're doing it, which is, which is a beautiful thing. It teaches emotional resilience. Now, a lot of these kids, particularly in Cape Town, where I was spending time with this charity, but I'm sure it's the same over here, a lot of children who, who have experienced horrendous life events struggle with emotional resilience almost by definition. They haven't got the support network or the positive relationships needed to pick them back up again and get them back on their feet um, and to keep going. And what surfing does is just being in the water with a surfboard, you'll see children, they'll fall off. The first time, they'll, they'll, they'll fall off. Um, but guess what? They'll get back on again, and they'll try again, and they'll fall off again, and they'll get back on again, and they'll keep doing it. No one's telling them to do it. There isn't a therapist saying, get back on your board, because it'll teach you how to be resilient. They're just doing it. So again, it's teaching children this incredibly important value of resilience without, re without realizing it. And then lastly, I think it's, like I've mentioned in the previous point, it's, it's a very supportive environment. People are encouraging each other. It's not competitive. There's no judgment. You know, so I think in summary, you know, it's a safe emotional space. It's a supportive environment, which is key. It's fun. It's calming. There's no judgment. It teaches kids to be present and in the moment, not worrying about what's happening tomorrow what happened yesterday or last week. They are absolutely focused on being present and in the moment. And it teaches them confidence and resilience, which they can then take away with them and apply in their everyday life. In terms of why bets hang out, there's a number of different reasons. First of all, if I just take a step back, the Southeast of the UK is not necessarily renowned for being, you know, a surfing mecca with super consistent epic waves. There are some spots around the Kent coast 
which can light up if there's a solid northerly groundswell that comes through. But those conditions are pretty rare, and I would say world-class waves here um, generally don't tend to happen. So what does happen really is, apart from the core surf community, you know, people do travel a long way to Devon, North Cornwall, and also further afield to catch to catch you know decent decent waves on a regular basis despite the fact that there aren't i would say epic conditions here or maybe because of it there is actually a core surf community which is pretty pretty awesome uh, and also there's a mo there's a large demographic of people who do sports and pursuits which have a really close synergy and connectivity into surfing so things like mountain biking bmxing kite surfing, stand-up paddleboarding, skateboarding, trail running, you name it. There's a whole bunch of different activities which have very, very close synergies and mindsets and value systems to surfing. And specifically with regards to Betis Hanger, so first of all, the connectivity is key for us. You know, it's very easy to get to the local areas, to the surrounding counties, into London and also even to Northern Europe. It's, it's, it's pretty close. So accessibility and connectivity are really important. Secondly, you know, it's an existing 250 acre country park, which already has a number of fantastic facilities on offer. There's 10 kilometers of mountain bike trails. There's five kilometers of, of running trails. There's a forest school. There's a whole host of other things. Um, and as a result, there's a demographic of people who love doing those pursuits and are therefore I believe that they'll have a natural affinity to surfing and the culture and the vibe and the ethos they will be bringing to market here at the Sea Hive if things go to plan. And then thirdly, geotechnically, you can't just plonk a wave pool down you know, anywhere. There's a certain number of geotechnical criteria, requirements and characteristics which need to be met. So we did a detailed geotech survey on this piece of land earlier on in the year, which came back positive. So from a feasibility perspective, we knew that it was possible. So obviously that's a massive box to tick. You know, all those things are really important, you know, and need to be looked at in the round to ensure that a location is, is, is right. It's also worth mentioning ecology. So ecology and ensuring that we as a team are able to protect and ideally enhance the existing eco ecology of a, of a parcel of land that we were, we were able to find was very, very important in terms of our criteria and our land selection. So upfront, even before I came across this parcel of land, it was very, very important and a key, a key criteria for us. Now, I'm aware that, you know, this parcel of land that we're proposing to build the Sea Hive on currently supports a number of different habitat types, including lizard orchids, some invertebrates, and also provides some foraging opportunities for turtle doves and other bird species. You know, I'm aware of that, and we've been aware of that as a team for nearly two years. You know, in fact, when I first sat down with the owners of the park to discuss this potential opportunity and the feasibility of of building it here, I was absolutely insistent that as a prerequisite, as an imperative, as an absolutely you know, immovable requirement, we dealt with any existing ecology. We sought to devise a plan up front that would protect it and enhance it in the long run. They agreed to allocate a parcel of land of what is nearly 30 acres, so give or take twice as big as the one that we're planning to lease dedicated to an ecologically led enhancement program for the long term. They also agreed to provide a, an ecology warden who would be responsible for the long term management. And they also agreed to basically a, a visitor management program designed to do two things really. One is to educate visitors to the park about the local ecology. Uh, and then secondly is to direct footfall and you know, high levels of footfall traffic away from the most ecologically sensitive areas. So it's been very important to me and my team up front. The owners of the park have taken it very seriously indeed. We mapped out an ecology plan a long time ago, 
way before we submitted the planning application and we do fundamentally believe that our ecology plan will not just protect what we've got here but actually look to enhance it in the long run. My understanding is that in the long run a lot of it may succumb to scrub that without proper oversight and management. Therefore, you know, we believe that our plan will address that and protect it for generations to come. And as part of that, we anticipate generating around about 11% net biodiversity gain. In terms of timescale, so we're very, very keen to bring forward the economic, social and community benefits of the scheme as obviously as early as possible. We believe that if everything goes to plan and we are able to secure planning permission, we believe we can open the doors in around about April 2025. I've built a team around me of collaborators, investors uh, and board members who all bring something unique to the table in terms of their expertise and experience and their capabilities, but they all share in my passion for this project. We're all equally passionate about it. One of them, funnily enough, is a chap who I met on a surf trip eight or nine years ago who pretty much planted the seed in my head back then. He ended up going on to found or co-found Urban Surf in, in Australia, uh, which is a wave pool open in Melbourne, and there's another one under construction in Sydney due to open in 2024. Um, so very priv privileged to have him on board and providing his advice uh, because obviously he's been through this process before. Um, but essentially, you know, it's been a journey to get to this point. Uh, we've got a long road ahead of us. We need to get through planning, and, but we're all very excited about what we can create. In summary, the vision is to create a, an immersive, world-class surf wellness resort with epic waves and which is deeply purpose-led. So in other words, which is authentic, inclusive, anchored around health and well-being, both physical and mental, is educational and is rooted in sustainability. You know, we have a vision to create a really immersive and accessible lifestyle where people of all ages and all abilities can really get amongst it. One which fosters an environment where people can push boundaries, where they can make new friendships, where they can experience personal growth, where they can improve their own physical and mental fitness and overall well-being. One which is a, an educational platform and a hub, and also a place where communities can really connect.